Hi, welcome everybody to ESI's session on University Esports. Woo, bring it in. So guys, I gotta admit, I honestly think that the university area is the most exciting part of esports, right? And we are so lucky to have some experts here, not just from the region, from around the world, people who have been there at the very beginning of university esports, or somebody who may correct me and say, I'm not supposed to say the word university anymore, right? But um, I'd love to get it kicked off with my friend Kevin, who um, is at Ekaterina now, but started way back in the early days of University Esports in 2017, working at Twitch with their campus initiative. So I'd love to hear what it was like then and what's exciting about University Esports now. Kevin, take it away. Hi, everyone. Yeah, no, um, thank you so much. Uh, I was at Twitch and Amazon for about four years. I led the global esports initiative when it comes to education and uh, education and esports. So basically worked on over 700 official varsity esports program, including University of California, Irvine, UCLA, uh, USC, NYU, and schools around the world that wanted this. And I think it's definitely gone a lot easier. Uh, before, I had to explain to people what Fortnite was and why it's so important and why this matters. Um, now, the consciousness when it comes to speaking with education decision makers have been elevated over the last several years because of all the hard work and all the people that have pushed this movement. And so I'm just grateful to be part of that. I, you know, For me, I started off being my own uh, club president and to be able to have an official esports program at the University of Washington where I got my roots uh, and now seeing it becoming a global movement. Um, it's, not, it's just been amazing to see this social paradigm shift that I think is desperately needed in our space today. Can I double click on that desperately needed part, <laughs> right? Like, what do you mean by that, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, Gen Z, Gen A, they're you know lonelier than ever. They're spending so much time online, and how do you take something that they do all the time but remap it in a way that is uh, feasible in the place that they always spend time in? You spend time, like 20 plus years of your life in school, Right, and you go there every day, but why can't these schools be the place for our culture, the place for us to learn about these things that matter for the next 10, 20 years, right? So I, we started at school because it just made so much sense. It created this access that you no longer needed to be in Los Angeles, you don't need to be in Singapore, you don't need to be in South Korea. You can leverage the internet to scale the way that you want to uh, create programs that matter for, these, for the next generation. I love that. It, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, how college life becomes almost like its own global culture, connected, right? Um, but beyond that, I also think that the, call it competitive advantage of, of school has in this world is how well it embraces new culture, right? I chose my university based on sneaking into a computer lab and playing Doom on supercomputers. Um, and I think Mervyn, you're working with some schools, and how do you use esports as a competitive advantage in Malaysia, right? I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, um, basically, I, I partner with Phil College in Malaysia. Based, um, they, they came to me to really come to a solution. How can they make a standout different from the rest of the college? Um, and they love to embrace esports. So my, my solution to them basically is... Um, what you need to marry your program with esports is pretty much not rocket science, but existingly, what programs do you have is just need to craft up um, the elements of esports. Um, take for example, um, recently I partnered with Sunway College, um, whereby they already have a diploma program in event management, but event management has been there and um, for decades, and then every college also offer the same thing. But what would be better if you go to an education fair and you shut, start shouting about my programs, event management, specialize in esports? Um, so this is the syllabus whereby I um, consult and work together with them. We call join and develop the programs together. Yeah. What an amazing thing, right? I can't imagine an events company not knowing how to do esports or. Uh, hybrid events, right? And I think esports are the original hybrid event. But similar to Mervyn, 
These needs aren't just a Malaysian thing, right? Um, Gerald, you're kind of spearheading the NASEF, which, I don't know, same, same, but different. What do you, what do you reckon, sir? So, first of all, NASEF is a network of academic scholastic esports federations. We're all over the world. We're an NGO. We're a nonprofit. We work with 200,000 plus students in over 30 countries uh, in what we do. So I'm going to kind of take your question or your comment and move it off in a different direction because that's just kind of how I like to speak. One, if you don't have a college that's part of your esports program, go get one. If you don't have a high school that's part of your esports program, go get one and build it. And if you have one of each, put them together because that's what kids want. Kids want the ability to enjoy, have fun, learn, and play at the same time. And what colleges offer is the ability to provide a venue, not only for play, for a place where communities can congregate, where you can build culture, but it also gives you the opportunity for the kids to explore who they are and their future and what they want to be. And eSports is great for competition. It's great for the opportunity to play and enjoy. It's great for building community and culture, but it's also the pathway for their future. And that's why college eSports is so important in today's world and tomorrow's world. It is the hub of what we can do and how we can build the kind of credibility and the value proposition for students, for their future, for parents, and for educators. Man, Gerald, I am so unlucky that I was born too late to be in the esports program in the university, right? Because it sounds like community, able to actually put the things I learned into a constructivist mindset, so actually build things, right? Like put into practice the skills that are supposed to get me a job before I need to get a job with people I love around subject I'm passionate about, right? And I think that, Phil, you probably have some, some opinions on this, right? Yeah, so uh, first off, you guys are all probably wondering why I'm up here being uh, part of a tech manufacturing company that makes broadcast equipment. Um, well, eSports uh, is something that I'm extremely passionate about. I've been in the eSports industry for seven years as a director, as a game director, as an observer director, and I come to Ross to champion eSports for the company, but also make sure that uh, anyone in eSports has that voice. And one of those big key voices we've been seeing lately is in the education industry. Um, you know, we talked about a recession earlier. I call it more of a lull, but I think realistically the next phase of development that the esports industry needs to see is the foundation of growth that education can provide. Um, we've kind of seen that initial tentpole rise where you have a lot of uh, investors coming in trying to get return on their investment. But the reality is esports was created by people like us who are passionate about gaming, passionate about telling stories in the space, and now we are getting that back in our hands, and that is really the key of education and the growth there. Um, so I've been very fortunate to be a part of some uh, colleges lately that are putting in some esports production um, programs, where students are not only able to learn the coaching side of it, the playing side of it, but they're actually learning tangible skills in the live production industry, and they're doing that on real production equipment. So that when they leave with their degree, they not only have been able to build that degree creating content that they love around games and around the community that they love, but they're able to actually go out into the industry with those skills. And that makes the industry better because we now will have trained industry veterans in the production industry who are also passionate about esports, uh, who are also gamers. And I can tell you firsthand, when you're working on an esports production and they bring in some hotshot director who directed the Golden Globes but has no idea anything about esports, it's a disaster. You have to have that foundation of passion and knowledge around the games that you're covering. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts about uh, education and esports is being able to nurture that growth in the next generation and then give them the tools to, like Gerald said, be successful in the world that they're going to build. Uh, and they're the ones who are gonna create all the, all the answers to the problems that we've been talking about. They're the ones who are gonna show us the way uh, to greatness. So it's something I'm very passionate about. I do a lot of guest lectures um, from my days of in-game production. So although I do represent a tech company, um, it, education is something I take very seriously. And at Ross, we are very focused on nurturing that development in the industry so that we can give back and ultimately pave the way for the future of esports. So cool. But I gotta say, it sounds amazing to be a college student, but 
when I look out in the crowd, I don't see very many college students out there, right? Any college? Oh, no? Yes? Maybe? Right. We're all business people, so what's exciting about the business of university esports? Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Everybody. All the mics go up, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I was very fortunate enough to serve as the board chair for five years at the University of California Irvine uh, esports group. Uh, with Mark Deppie and the team, and for those of you who follow eSports in America, uh, UCI was like the kingpin for a long time. What I learned in that process and by being involved with the Regents of California is what a great opportunity for the benefit of the university for recruitment, for fundraising, for finding the best of the best. You know, college itself is always competitive, but when you can find a student who loves what they do, loves the fact that you've got an esports program, loves the fact that you have a great school of engineering, school of comp sci, school of graphic design, whatever it may be, it's really the trifecta. It's the opportunity to really go ahead and be able to market yourself and brand yourself in a way that differentiates. Look at schools, and, and I know these guys well, so they don't mind my talking about it. Look at Chen and Doohan, look at Joey G, look at Boise State, you know, and look at Doc Haskell. These are little schools, with all due respect. They're not the Ohio States, they're not the UCLA's, they're not the Stanford's. But you know what? They are incredibly competitive in esports, and they are attracting great students who pay full tuition sometimes. They attract students from all over the world. And it's a wonderful opportunity as a differentiator for who they are. And what it really does in many ways, it levels the playing field for higher education, which is really critically important. And it gives us as parents, us as family, you as students, a real choice of what you want to look at for your future careers. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, um, you know, tuition, recruitment, those are, uh, those are key conglomerates and business models in esports education. One of the other sides is actually venues. Um, if you have a university or a school where you build a multi-purpose venue, if you build it as an esports venue, you'll be able to do anything with it. So you build it as an esports venue, but then you're able to do TED Talks, you're able to do corporate events, you're able to do concerts. So now all of a sudden you're opening up all these multiple forms of revenue from different applications out there. So you're not completely relying on esports every single day. Now, not to say that the arena won't be filled with esports events every single day, but ultimately what you're doing is you're not hedging your bets on that one horse. You're able to actually have a multi-purpose arena. And then if you're teaching students production skills, they're also able to kind of diversify their skill set with working on a multitude of events uh, and being able to really see those through to the end. So we're seeing these really interesting business models come through. Actually. ESI, here's a plug for you guys. Uh, we have a podcast that we're partnering on, and um, I did a really nice interview with uh, the CTO at Confetti X Arena, which is this state-of-the-art um, uh, trade school in England where they have an amazing esports production program, and the students are working on championship events while they're students, but then they're also able to do their own pet projects. They're also able to become competitors, so it really opens up all of those opportunities. So I think we need to stop looking at esports arenas as it's only going to be esports. We need to start building arenas that can be used for multi-purpose reasons, but we build them for esports. They're esports first. The rest of the money can come from those other third-party events. Wow. Um, so the only thing I had to add to this was, uh, for me, I'm a, I'm a product of college esports. I ran my own club. I got my club funded by the school to build an official esports program at the University of Washington. I ended up a few years later raising venture capital for my own startup, right? And we just had an event in the Philippines that brought over 175,000 people over three days. <clears throat> brought Valkyrie over to Southeast Asia for the first time. So to me, college esports is just a way for you to build your consciousness, meaning learn all the things you need to learn, be with people that you want to be with, and meet like-minded people to just try things, to mess up on things, to run your first land, to practice, to get good at a game. These are just the sandbox that makes it, uh, that makes it, this whole industry what it is. And universities, high schools, academic institutions, they're just here to create that sandbox and it creates opportunities for people like me, first generation Asian American, 
that you know this was not something I ever thought I'd be on, this path. And so to me, it's really that pathway to unlock a lot of these possibilities. And it's really cool to see you know, <clears throat> Filipino youth uh, take this to the next level because it's a society with so much suffering. It's a society where students do not have control of their time, meaning that they, on an average commute, it's about five hours a day to get to school or to get to wherever they need to go. With the internet and gaming culture it, and with creator economy, it allows you to supercharge the thing that you're really good at. And that, to me, is you know, what I love about this industry is the power of the individual. And you saw that uh, all across this industry over the last 10 years. The power of the individual, right? And Seth Godin also says, we live in an attention economy where the biggest companies in the world, you know, maybe not Twitch, but Facebook, <laughs> Google, uh, TikTok, all of these things that dominate our headlines are attention economy businesses. We live in the world of their creator economy. And on the spear tip of that is university esports, right? And so what everybody here is talking about is that the infrastructure, the talent, the career progression, the ability to have a sandbox where you can have real impact on the world around you, but still be safe. So you can be risky and brave, but also, you know, maybe burn your fingers, but you won't lose a finger along the way, and that was a little too gr gruesome, right? <laughs> or maybe I should count my fingers later. Um, but how does that work in Southeast Asia? Like, what does that look like, right? Because in America, we have a strong heritage of NCAA basketball, college football, and that's pretty much it, <laughs> right? But how does that work in Southeast Asia, guys? In Malaysia, um, particularly, um, I think the college um, landscape for eSport is pretty much still developing. Um, most of the college or university campuses, they have their eSport clubs, but the university is just starting to embrace eSport to bring it into more activities, more competition, eSports uh, um, among collegiate, and then they also um, looking into um, embracing eSport into their existing program to offer more courses, more programs from degree to diploma to certifications. So this is what's happening in Malaysia and I'm happy to be part of um, the journey together with the college. You know, there's another part to it and that is that a lot of people look to places outside their own country for examples, opportunities, guidance, etc. One of the things that we're seeing is, how do I get my child to go to a university in the United States or the United Kingdom or into Singapore or somewhere else? What are the scholarship benefits? Last year alone, in the US, they gave away $21 million to universities to be able to play esports and to be able to matriculate in whatever degrees that they wanted. Those are incredible opportunities, and when you're coming from Southeast Asia or you're coming from other countries, one of the things that you want is you want the ability to thrive and grow and be as successful as you can be and have fun while you're doing it. And the universities that are happening around there are all emulating, they're copying each other, they're trying to figure out what to do. Part of what we're doing, for example, in NASAF is we're going around Southeast Asia and the world and we're helping them understand what are the various models that are out there. Not that our model works, but how do we then think about ways in which you can create a model that works for your culture and your community and gives your student and your individual the opportunity to thrive and grow? And how can you do what you want to do within your university or in your high school or even your middle school in a way that provides that pipeline for what that can be? And what it does is it makes the world better. It allows for a smaller, more congenial world. It allows for people to respect and value each other because we all bring something to the equation. And it's an incredible opportunity for social responsibility. That's something that misses the conversation in esports oftentimes, and that is that we are a tool and a vehicle for social responsibility and social impact. And the ability to be able to do it and use it in a way that adds good besides just fun and pleasure and education is really an untold story that I think we need to amplify more and more. Um, I've been living here for the last year and a half, um, moved my life from Seattle to the Philippines. Love it out there. I just think the, I think Southeast Asia is 
100% the sleeping dragon for entertainment. Uh, we look at history, you know, Japan and Korea, we've been through, society goes through war, science, and arts. Look what Korea and Japan has done the last 20 years with arts and the entertainment industry. Southeast Asia has not fully realized that potential just yet, and I think that's where the big bet and the next opportunity lies. It has 900 million, we have 900 million people across 10 countries, and we're a very creative group of people. We're a hardworking group of people that's been through and never had our way of expressing ourselves because we've been having, all we had to think through, my parents, all they had to think through was survive the Vietnam War, raise kids, put them through college. We just never had that moment where we can celebrate um, and hone our skills. And I think that part is really, really exciting. And I think that's the best part of my job is to be able to work and deconstruct what that really means and how do you make it more accessible at your sorry, sorry stores, at your PC bongs, at your coffee shops? How do you create the third home effect where the culture could still be encapsulated by leveraging the technology that we have today? So that what makes me really excited to get to work every day. And I think a, a big part as well, feeding off of both those comments um, from Gerald and Kevin, it's really important that we continue to destigmatize esports in the minds of the parents. I think we still see a lot of parents that don't take esports seriously as a career. They don't take esports seriously as an investment, as a collegiate investment. And the reality is, gaming, just like athletics, physical athletics, it, it builds problem solving skills, it builds communication skills, it builds social skills. It has value in the minds of the youth. Uh, and I think it's really key that that message continues to be brought across. And universities are often seen as the guiding light for, for, for how parents will view their children's future. And so I think that is really important, uh, in Southeast Asia especially, that we continue to solidify and validate the esports industry and validate, even if their kids don't become esports professionals, they don't become esports production professionals, even just being a part of the esports club. You know, like what Kevin said, it did wonders for him while he was in school. And ultimately, it was something he was passionate about. And then he was able to build all of these other skills on top of it that made him the professional that he is today. So I think it's really important that we all remember that, that those of us that love esports, we get it but we're still doing the work to convince all the parents out there that are investing their money in their ch ch uh, child's future and investing their love in their children. L let me bring it full circle to the topic, which is university engagement, and that is affirmation and validation, because what universities have is incredible credibility in their local community in their country, wherever they may be. And when they are part of what we're talking about in this ecosystem, to the parent, to the educator, to the grandparent, to the student himself or herself, it gives that sense of, wow, there's something that really is secure and solid here that provides something different and unique. And my child or me as a student may not know where I want to go or what I want to do, but you know, my local university, my local polytech, my local technology school, whatever it may be, they offer play and learning and they combine it in a way that I can enjoy and have fun and still create a career opportunity for myself. The stamp of university approval is so important in the development of community and community culture. And then in addition to that, what you're seeing more and more, because we see it here in Southeast Asia often, is the desire to want to do research. Research validates, and when research comes out, and especially if it's independent, and it demonstrates that there is a nexus between play and learning, play and workforce, play and human thriving and development, that continues to add that value. Universities play a critical role in this ecosystem that we're talking about of what's known as esports. I know a little about esports. But I'm sitting here realizing that I get so much stuff wrong about university esports, and I'm learning so much from you guys, right? Because one thing I can't help but notice is that none of you guys say competition is an important part of university esports, right? It, it doesn't seem like that's even on your radar. It's more about community, inclusivity, the ability to learn, to self-develop. 
even the word actualization pops up in my head, right? So what else are we getting wrong about university esports? Like, is, or is it about competition and I just have been missing the plot? plot. It, it, it's all of the above. You know, the, the thing that it offers is diversity and opportunity, not just to people who may want to attend and do, but the whole gambit or spectrum of what do I want to experiment with? You know, part of youth and youth development is trying and trying things and failing and picking yourself up and trying again. We see that in traditional sports. You know, you fail in school, you fail in life, it's tough. But if you fail in sport, what do you do? You pick yourself up and you try again, you try a little harder. And it gives that opportunity for that growth, that development, that validation, that opportunity. And I think that it is so important, especially in the digital world where we see our students growing up and learning and understanding. It's no longer like me. I mean, I'm old compared to all of you guys and gals. You know, I grew up in this physical world and the digital space came on after me. In today's world, the digital space is the reality. How do we go ahead and provide that opportunity for them in a way that's a magnet and makes sense? It's competition, it's education, it's learning, it's community development, it's a whole lot of different types of things. Universities play a critical role in all of that. Yeah, and I think the reason, uh, you know, to your point, the reason that we're kind of veering away from just competitive, that when you think about collegiate esports, that's kind of a given. That's a no-brainer, right? You start thinking, how can my college be the greatest, or how can my university be the greatest, have the greatest esports League of Legends team, for example. But I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to broaden the horizons of how we view collegiate esports and cover that full gambit, that full spectrum, because it really is important that we start educating everyone out there as to all the benefits. Um, so that's kind of my, my point on it is, yeah, you can focus on just the competitive side, but in reality, there's so much more there that can be of value to the students and the communities that are attending these universities. And, and there's also a lot more, there's a lot more benefits that you can focus on to get that buy-in, to get that investment, to put your university on the map um, and, and be a, an esports powerhouse or just be a very, have a great esports program that touches the lives of students um, and changes their lives. Um, two points on this. Uh, one, uh, we're rolling out our organized play ecosystem uh, for this school year, uh, but we're regionalizing it, so it's based on your city and your town. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is because we want to create achievable milestones, meaning that people that are competing from like Mindanao or only compete with students in Mindanao first before they qualify to get a seat at Conquest, which is our festival where the finals happens for our eSports League for our students. Uh, what I, we're modeling it very based off of Japanese high school sports. Um, I'm trying to turn collegiate and high school eSports into like a sports anime. I really feel like we went too far down the path of varsity eSports and varsity sports. I do not think it needs to be too sports-like. There's elements of anime that I want to integrate across our ecosystem that I think does a really, really great job. Uh, so that's one thesis. Like, I'm not giving up on it. I do think there's a lot we could do there. I think um, people in emerging markets, I, they care so much about being number one. They care so much about getting a free flight to Manila to battle on the greatest stage because to them, this is the best it can get. This is as far as they see themselves, right? But afterwards, some of them end up competing in the SEA Games, right? So we have students that competed and on the Alliance stage at Conquest ended up going to qualifying for the Olympics, right? It was just expanding what they're comfortable with and they never thought they can get there. So can we do it in a way that's our flavor, that's our culture, instead of going the full-on varsity sports route? I think the last five years of eSports, we've listened too much of the sports narrative, which I think is flawed. I think we need to listen to more of the anime narrative, which it creates, makes it way more exciting. Um, on the second point, when we work with schools in, uh, at a direct level, uh, schools, uh, we partner with National University of Laguna. It's the first ever eSports program to ever exist in the Philippines. Uh, we come from it the way that Gerald and, <clears throat> and Phil have described it, where it's multidisciplinary, it's a space that cultivates all different types of learning. And I do think those are key elements to building the right ecosystem because uh, when we first started out this collegiate esports narrative, you know, it was just 
do whatever it takes to get an esports program off the ground, whether that lives in student life, whether that lives in varsity sports, whether that lives in media, right? Now we can help control the narrative based on the mistakes that have been made in the past. So those are the areas that I think I'm really excited about. So I've got a couple of silly questions. How many of you have all the money you need and want for esports? How many of you would like to get more money for your esports program? Come on, people, raise your hands. I'm sure you all could use money and you all could use resources. I love money, so I'm always you know, raising my hand. I don't know, if you guys don't love money, well, then keep your hand down. One, one of the things that universities and colleges have is they have endowments, they have relationships with government entities, they have alumni, they have opportunities for you to partner with to develop the relationships both for funding, for programmatic work, for educational work, for competition work, that is something that people don't often pay enough attention to. When you go to your local college or community, one, it adds credibility in the conversation you have with your local government, with your state government, with your country government, whether it's the Minister of Sport, Minister of Education, the business industry, Chamber of Commerce, whomever it may be. When they're involved and they're invested in the program, that adds credibility to your conversation. And when you could say to them, I can add students to your program, I can help create the kind of infrastructure, the kind of critical thinking, the innovation that we need as a society to grow and to, and to develop and to do, they are a natural partner in a conversation for you to have around how do you build sustainability for your esports program. Wow. So, I keep thinking about how, how Gen Alpha is sometimes called like the lean back kind of generation, right? Like online, disconnected and whatnot. And thinking about as leaders, educators, people who are forward thinkers, what is our responsibility to kind of get them to lean in, right? Who here has been at an event with more than 10,000 people? Raise your hand. Okay, keep them up if it's 20,000. 50,000, 80,000, 100,000, 150,000, right? Like, just last month, there was an event hitting Gen Alpha, or millennials, I, I, I screw up these terms all the time, getting 180,000 people in one place excited. And that is the kind of, you know, like community spirit that I think university esports can really bring forward because that is why the resources that Gerald is talking about, that unlocks the entrepreneurial, build it, make it, be it kind of um, mentality that Phil talks about, and also how Mervyn can help all these universities engage and use this as a competitive advantage to get students to engage more, to get better academic outcomes, and to really build a better world better than we leave it to them, right? So thinking about that, like we've got five more minutes, so I'd just love to like, um, ask you guys a random question. If, imagine if you guys were all college students again, right? And I know, Gerald, you just graduated, so. Right? <laughs> what would you be doing at your esports club and why? I'll take on first. Um, if I'm still in college, I think that first of all, definitely organize more tournaments for uh, my peers so that they can have fun. It's competition. And then, um, yeah, there's plenty of opportunity. You can actually um, learn from it and win, lose, win again, play again, and come back. Yeah, yeah if, I, if I were in college again, God, I got to go back many years. Um, I would want to build an ambassadorship and mentorship program for kids in my community. I would want to give them the opportunity to see their future that they may not see. They may come from a situation where college is just something that is not in their future. They may see that they don't have a place to belong. They may see something that is just not a future for themselves. I would want to be in that position to where I could say to them, you know, through esports, we can build community. We can build affirmation. We can build opportunity. We can give you that vision that you may not see for yourself right now. But through esports and what you can do through our college and our university, 
we can give you a sense of who you want to be. How do I connect passion, play, and purpose? How do I give you that ability to thrive and grow and be all you can be? Uh, I would be a VTuber. I would really try my hand at VTubing right now. Honestly, that, that would be something I'd do. Showing my, age here, yeah, like, yeah, I just think it's so much fun. Like the the D and D you could do with it, the role playing you could do with it. So much has so much cool things you can geek around and just be a, just go, just do stupid stuff. I think I would just be have a lot of fun with that. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I'm with Kevin on this one. Um, I would have I would I would have tried to become an influencer in that way. Um, but I think what I would have now that I'm a little older, a little older, um, what I would have really focused on is mental health, I think. Um, trying to build a platform that I could then inspire other people that watch me and the people that I influence and inspire them to do good, um, inspire them to work on themselves, not be ashamed of any mental health um, issues they come across. And I think we're starting to see that more in the esports industry as this uh, kind of focus on mental health and make it, especially post COVID. So, yeah, I think I would, uh, I would do that. Uh, and I love the fact that you get to kind of be a director, you get to be a creative, you get to be an entertainer, but you also get to play games and just kind of be yourself. And then you get to inspire people. And I think um, I think I would love that platform. You guys you, are all, what about you? Yeah, what about you, Chris? I would be a stage engineer because I really like plugging things in and pulling them out and making chords. Like, oh, yeah. nothing makes me happier than just to plug things and get shocked a little bit, right? But just the opportunity to play and do new things and, like, get the dopamine hit for me of, you know, like, even in my, in my past careers of just to watch the viewership go from zero to one to ten to a hundred and all the way up. That satisfaction and that ability reinforcement that what I do as a college student matters to more people, that is what gives, would give me the trajectory to continue to grow and learn on my own terms, right? That kind of motivation that we all want to instill on our children, our little brothers, our siblings, college students, ourselves, right? It's something that esports can give us. And for me, plugging in those freaking little things, Great. If you want to plug cables in, Chris, I got a job for you right now, man. <laughs> talk to me afterward. Uh, I'll talk to my wife. Um, actually, we have five more minutes, so I'm just curious. Does anybody in the audience want to ask? Ooh, couple hands immediately. Uh, we got a runner? Oh, we got a runner. Sweet. Okay, hi everyone. Okay, so education topic, especially in eSport, is something that I always interested in. So my question is, because um, you guys haven't talked about this in the panel, so I want to ask you that I sense a prevailing issue in esports industry within Southeast Asia, and I'm from Indonesia, uh, namely the lack of skilled manpower and professional in esports industry. And what are the best strategies to be implemented to attract and motivate the best students to pursue careers within the esports industry? Because I also have a student program in Indonesia and we connect with more than 50 universities in Indonesia. And we have student leaders in every university. And when I ask them, like, do you want to have a career in gaming or esports? Most of them, they say, mm, I don't think so. But we need to think that this industry is more than just being a pro player, working in a broadcast, right? There are lots of jobs that need like, professional backgrounds, such as lawyers, HR, human resources. We need lots of psychologues, or actually, like in this esports industry, right? We need someone who has like, a strong leadership skills as well. So those students, they're, they're great students, they're very smart, but then they love esports, but they don't want to pursue their career in this industry. But if we are talking about the sustainability in, for the industry, we need the best people possible in the industry, right? So what's your take on this? Thank you so much. I would just say it all starts with passion, like you said. And I think the more large esports becomes and the more opportunities they, ha they have, 
um, that problem is going to go away because they're going to come in saying, I love esports and I want to be a lawyer. Then they're going to be passionate about esports law and they're going to start studying everything that they can about that. So I think in my eyes, the key to education is two things, passion, curiosity. And if you can take that and have, cho have students that are passionate and curious, then the education facility builds the infrastructure, builds the framework to nurture that growth. But ultimately, they need that passion as fuel, and they need that curiosity as open-mindedness to be able to find their way as they're growing into adults. So I guess my, my answer is you're, you're doing all the right stuff right now, and I think the key is to find partners, to find professors that can maybe expand their, their classes and have if it's a law class, they can teach one day or, or have a sector on esports law or, or whatever it might be. I think it's, it's getting the university to buy in as a whole so you can integrate the esports side of technology into each of the degrees. And, and that's kind of how I see it in the future growing personally. Uh, my take on this is that a lot of the esports professionals that I met in the industry in the last year and a half here, they come from the most craziest cut of cloth I've ever met. Like the opportunities are not equal here compared to the states. And finding the first job, second job, third job is not a linear progression. Um, as much as you can prepare them, it, the best I would say is just prepare their mindset. It's gonna be scrappy and it's not easy to make it in this industry. I was sleeping on mattress floors when I started out and the same goes out to here uh, because of the industry has not evolved fast enough yet for the excitement that you see. Um, so right now, it's, it's still a real challenge. Um, the best you can do is pair them up with any level of internship, any level of placement out of the 50. If one takes a bite at it, then you have a village hero that you can tell a story to, and then you can show uh, proof of concepts of like placement at that point, especially if you have 50. Filling 50 jobs is already difficult enough. And I guess maybe I'm just a little too practical. Um, build an esports club, build an esports team, compete. Because if you do, you're going to need a streamer, you're going to need a shoutcaster, you're going to need someone who's going to do contracts for uh, the players, you're going to need someone who's going to put on events, you're going to need someone who could be the cameraman, someone who can do the audio technology, someone who can negotiate the contract for the rent for the building where you're going to have the competition. You're going to need an entire ecosystem in order to make your esports program successful. Try, fail, try, fail, try, try, try. Put it together, get out there, have fun with it, and you will find people who will find the niches of what they enjoy doing through the fun of playing esports. It's interesting, right? I think that there are a lot of esports organizations at the university level which are transferring some really valuable skills. And then the graduates are finding that their skills actually apply to things that are not in esports, which is actually a great outcome for the student, right? Like, we are trying to serve many different stakeholders here at the same time, right? And Deb, you want to hire awesome people, right? And students want to have the most opportunities they have. Um, universities want to just have the best students who have the best careers afterwards. And, you know, of course, then the question is, how do we tighten up the pipeline between people who are in an esports university program to work for you? And I think part of it is that we have to acknowledge that we are very early, right? We are in the fastest industry and the media side ever, right? How long did it take for basketball, baseball, which, still is under development, right? Like football and American football, all of these things. And here, like, we have witnessed esports just kind of pop up at the same time that COVID popped up. Like COVID is the number one thief of esports talent because every hybrid event is really an esports event wearing different clothes, right? And so this is actually a good problem to have and as more people realize that the best way to get an amazing job, future-proofed, is to be an esports practitioner, I think we're in, we're in store for an amazing kind of future. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are just about at time. Oh, we have one more question. Okay. Yeah, I can. You, gentlemen, with the nice Hello. Uh, Boban from ISF. Uh, very good panel. Thank you for the nice insights. I just wanted to see how do you see balancing the professional education that's out there quite a lot, like on the professional level in the competition, towards 
free education available to everybody in the world and to the less developed regions in the world that actually need some kind of basis for them to start uh, joining the entire esports ecosystem. Is it possible? Because we know there is no good free education for anything, but can we like change the world and do it for esports? Thank you. Yeah, 100% agree with you. I would say I don't use my degree whatsoever, and I actually do not recommend esports degrees if anyone sells that to me, right? I would not take an esports degree to this day. Um, that's a hard stance because I think it's too rigid for the way the world is changing around you. Uh, I feel like if you can empower curiosity and finding ways to learn via YouTube University, learn through free sources of education, uh, the power of the internet is to enable you to be free from the constraints that you have, right? Like the Filipino high school reading level, like after the, the high school reading level is at a, at a seventh grade level after, after high school. Like that's not the system that will make you successful. The only way to do that, and that's why we partner with Starlink, is to create accessible places where you can get internet. Like that's like first come. You cannot have all this stuff curriculum unless you have internet, right? And some of these places don't even reach these parts of the world. And you know, for me, I have to choose my own battle. I'm a venture-backed company, so I have to grow in venture-backed way. But at the end of the day, if I would recommend it, just go through, take whatever, but never rely on school to be in, in charge of your success. Um, otherwise, you just fall through the cracks of the system, right? I mean, like, you have, you're commuting five hours a day, you're, you don't have your own time, right? You cannot, you're gonna miss practice, you're gonna miss those responsibilities, like, the everyday struggle here is real. And so, whatever you can to unlock those learning opportunities, um, so be it. And that's why, I like, when I said um, earlier for, uh, what's it called, uh, finding the right talent. One of my lead writers, she was a DMing in Facebook groups during the pandemic. She learned how to DM on Facebook groups in all these different D&D &D channels, and that's how she learned how to role play. That, I have never seen that type of expression of creativity before, and it's not getting a job at a company that you learned how to do lead writing. It was just because out of fandom, out of expression of your, the individual. So you're gonna have to get really scrappy in the way that you discover and find and hone talent here. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's my hard stance at it. And I've launched so many, I've seen, I worked on so many esports degrees. For me, it was just like, all right, I guess there's another esports degree that pays 40,000, yet that's charging students $40,000 a year, cool, but they're gonna get into debt and probably not learn anything, but they're gonna do it with or without me as Twitter and Amazon. So I gotta steer them down some sort of a correct way because those are outside of my control. And with that, I thank you guys, and thank you our esteemed panelists, Mervyn, Gerald, Kevin, and Phil. Uh, we have been your university esports guys. Please reach out to us afterwards for more esports excitement.